He said, happiness, my son, is about knowing what you want to do with your life and uh, having the gods to follow your heart. And that was very powerful. That was very, very powerful. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Ocasio, and welcome to another episode of Over the Wall. Today, I've got a friend who I consider one of the most extraordinary entrepreneurs in the globe, uh, Klaus Meyer. If you don't know Klaus, uh, Klaus started what is called the Nordic Food Movement. And if you don't know much about Nordic food, before Klaus existed, there wasn't much to move over there. So he took his entrepreneurial strength and power and built uh, one of the best restaurants, actually rated uh, the best restaurant in the world for many years in the entire world in Denmark. And Klaus and I met on a project uh, I was doing in Brownsville and he was doing something, we'll talk about that in a second, but he really brings entrepreneurism not only to cooking and food and restaurants, but he also has just brought it to giving and basically philanthropy in the world. So I wanna welcome you, Klaus, to the show. Thank you so much. I, I'm very happy to be here with you, Rob. So Klaus, maybe we could start. We met in the most peculiar way. Uh, you basically decided sometime a few years ago, I'm gonna pack up my family and move from Denmark, where I'm super successful, and go and try to open up uh, you know, a hospitality food uh, restaurant in New York City. And then we meet in the most peculiar way, which I'll let you tell the story. But, but how did that happen? Like you're in Denmark and you're like, I'm going to go New York and bring Nordic food to New York. And we can start there. Yeah. So, so I had um, kind of exited my, my, the company that I had founded and spent uh, 25 years uh, building in 2014 and become a minority owner. And I felt a lot of pressure leaving my body and uh, our kids, our, our three daughters had, um, I mean, they were nine, 12 and uh, and 17 at the time where we went to uh, New York City. Uh, because uh, why did we go there? We went there a little bit out of fun and a search for a family adventure. And um, I had received a, a strange invitation from a, 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 pre, a prominent, in a way, uh, American businessman who wanted to, to bring the spirit of the new Nordic cuisine and Noma and also the spirit of what he had um, experienced in, in Bolivia, uh, where I had been involved in a, in a social restaurant project in La Paz for a number of years. He wanted to bring all of that to New York City. And, and then I said, my, 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 my kids and my wife, they immediately fell in love with the idea uh, that we should go there as a family uh, and try to you know, build a life together. In, in, and, and, and then I kind of had to embark on this crazy uh, business project that was kind of the foundation for, for, our, for our, our, our going to live there in a way. I mean... I, I couldn't go on a three-year-long vacation being a serial entrepreneur, all, always on fire. So this was my professional justification for changing um, location for a while. And for the first time in many years, I had been thus embarking on a project not driven by a deep sense of purpose. So when I was walking around uh, spending millions of dollars on the build-out of uh, the Vanderbilt Hall in, in Grand Central Terminal and, and building a, a team composed of uh, 300 uh, professional um, hospitality and, uh, and culinary people, I felt that I had to do more. I had to do something truly meaningful. And so when I had all access to all of these resources, I needed to be somebody who provided resources to other people and um, I, I then, you know, started uh, walking up to people I didn't know in the city, asking them what would be a meaningful thing to embark on using food or deliciousness as an instrument. Uh, and, and who wouldn't make sense to, to lend a hand in this very affluent city? I asked, is there, any, is there still anyone who could need any kind of help? Because I'm someone who likes to help people. That uh, approach uh, one day had destiny or faith had me 
suddenly stand next to a young gentleman in Bedsty called uh, Lucas Denton. And we connected in on many on many levels. And uh, as he later told, many people, uh, you know, strike up conversations in queues, but very few of them actually called me up the next day to continue the conversation. And then I did that. And he was he was the gentleman who 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 taught me that my initial idea was slightly uh, uncalibrated, if not wrong. Uh, for this country and, the, and 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 that community, but also he he convinced me that we should check out Brownsville, and uh, a very patient process eventually led us to establishing this uh, educational facility and community center that we baptized Brownsville Community Culinary Center, and uh, that was somehow how I, I laid on right into Europe. Uh, obviously, for those who don't know Noma, and if you've never known anything about restaurants, then you probably don't know anything. But but if you've eaten in the world and you know anything about Michelin star restaurants and the best restaurants in the world, out of nowhere, I remember this in 2010, Noma, this restaurant in Denmark, becomes the best restaurant in the world. And and it's usually French, Italian, maybe some American, and you know Japanese, but here out of nowhere, it's rated the. I remember it was like a frenzy. There was articles like how that what how did that happen? And there you are at the center of it. You created it um, with your partner. We'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but how did you get? How did you get into food? I mean, what's your? How did you get to that world of entrepreneurism? You're a food entrepreneur. You know, it's more than that. Obviously, it's about hospitality. But how'd you get there, when as a kid, or what? 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 What drove you there? Well, my grandma was an incredible cook, and uh, she stayed with us uh, until I was 13 years old, and then unfortunately she passed away. Um, my mother um, uh, represented the first generation of Danish women working outside of the home, so she definitely was not somebody who wanted to cook. She wanted not to cook. And and uh, so I had horrible food in my during my entire childhood. Frozen vegetables from crazy Eastern European countries, and uh, you know, big stacks of margarine packed with trans fatty acids. Very cheap meat. Um, everything cooked with uh, no sense of pleasure. But but I so my father was an entrepreneur, and somehow. He, I mean, living with him and seeing how he ran his business gave me a, um, probably a sense of, of uh, how to go about things in your life. An opportunity that I had um, stumbled across and, and went on a recreational stay with an amazing man, uh, Mr. Guy Sversut, a fourth generation master chef and baker, and his um, incredibly warm hearted wife. A wonderful lady. I didn't know such a woman could exist on earth before I met her. And we connected in a magical way. I had, truly speaking, uh, been missing caring parents in my life for more than six, seven very important years in a young man's world. And these two uh, people, they could not have children. And I didn't know that. So, so they seemed to feel that I was the son that they had always wanted in their life. And, and, and they were the people who, who gave me a shelter and love and uh, they showed an interest for my dreams and my future. And, and they just spoiled me with the most incredible food. And, and he took me under his arms, under his wings and, and taught me everything he had learned from his father and his grandfather. And um, I came to associate great food with uh, the, the, an abundance of love. Also because in Denmark, there was a lack of, of deliciousness and a lack of love. Huh. And, and that was a very powerful idea um, to suddenly uh, see very clearly. So when I came back to Denmark, I felt very, I, I had this very strong, almost a calling that my obligation um, in my life should be to try to change Danish food culture for the better, to protect future children against 
growing up in families with horrible food and, and, and uh, parents divorcing in front of their eyes. So it's interesting because this, this very, I don't know if it's, you would call it an accident, but like you end up in the south of France. That wasn't a plan. But somehow I often say like there's this hand, you know, I say as an entrepreneur, there's a hand that guides us to this purpose. And it seems like you found that there. And then somehow you connected it to your vocation, your calling in, in the world. And then that just sets you free. And I walked free. through that door. And you walked, but wasn't it like, it seems so, I always say like a lot of times when we tell the stories, it's like, oh, this happened, that happened, and it all worked out. And now, you know, I, I've run the best restaurants and done all these things. So, but to walk through the door, what did it take to do it? Because you must have had some doubt. You must have thought, wow, I can't do this. Or, or was it like, I mean, how did you walk through that door? And that's what we say, like, how do entrepreneurs walk, walk through the door of thinking, I'm going to do this versus being an accountant. I'm going to do this versus getting a job. This doesn't make sense. I don't know anything about it. I don't have a skill. I wasn't, you know, I didn't go to college for this. I mean, what, what did you have to do there? You know, part of my upbringing, part of what I learned from my father that was that uh, that even though you choose something you don't like, you can fail. So you can fail in life at doing something you're not passionate about. So why not give love a chance? What, what he told me at a crucial moment uh, in my life uh, when I, he, he was a Renaissance man. He had absolutely no sense of cost or economic efficiency or EBITDA, or, or, or creating a profitable company. He just loved cooking. He loved life. He loved poetry. And he loved, he was a, probably the most generous man I've met in my entire life. And, and, some, and, and it was a little bit over the top for his wife because he was working very hard. And they had no money. Uh, they never traveled. They never bought, bought new clothes. And, and I suffered with her. And one day I just decided at the age of 20 to challenge Guy's um, business philosophy. But when I confronted Guy with, with uh, the mystery of his uh, business, um, not his cooking because his cooking was amazing, he looked at me, he said, happiness, my son, is about knowing what you want to do with your life and uh, having the gods to follow your heart. And that was very powerful. That was very, very powerful for me. He, he followed that phrase up, and that apparently was a, he was quoting someone called Félicien Marceau, a great French poet from the 18th century. And then he said, uh, "Haste is the worst enemy, not only for gastronomy, but also for love, hmm. and maybe for humanity as as such." Um, so Guy basically delivered a, a frontal attack on everything that constitute, constituted Danish gastronomy uh, or Danish cooking, I would say, because Danish gastronomy didn't exist. Um, and he gave me the courage to, um, to believe in, in faith and uh, to uh, you know, remain or, or, or become driven by a purpose more than by some... Uh, you know, perverted business plan. So this man almost becomes your mentor, your, I guess, like a father figure a he little bit. He becomes my a spiritual father figure for sure. He becomes your spiritual. And so, you know, we talked about this and, and uh, our dads, I remember you and I, we, we talked about this a couple days ago and your dad was, was uh, um, a different type of dad than Guy, right? It was just a different person. So you're, you're, it's interesting to, find your way to another fall. I mean, but you, you didn't have the easiest life with your own family. And I, and the reason I, I often feel like great entrepreneurs, it's not always an easy childhood. It, and I think there's a, the uncertainty of those childhoods sometimes allows us to build this base to handle doing something in the world that's different. I mean, he, he just won my heart. Uh, I, I, I hadn't loved my father for a very long time. I, he did, he, he did, a few things when I was 12, 13 years old that um, I, I could not forgive him for doing. But that doesn't mean that he, he didn't give me anything. Uh, so what I do remember from the early years was watching him, watching Muhammad Ali box and see him cry of uh, admiration 
uh, and and a very few times when when Muhammad Ali lost against I think Joe Frazier at some point, I I I saw my, my father crying of sorrow, um, and he had he had he had almost as strong feelings for Elvis Presley that he loved more than he loved my mother at any point in life. Um, so I saw my father admiring those heroes. And, and I, I do want to give him that. that. That has become very important in my life. That, though, that I have never had any, any, any problem um, getting inspiration from, from great people. Um, but uh, I, I must say that when I met Guy, my, my father was kind of out of the picture. I had learned when, since I was 14 to be on my own, find a way to connect to other people around me to survive. Um, so I developed, I guess, from, from this lack of fathership, I developed um, a, a, a certain capability for creating uh, very meaningful emotional relations to, to uh, people who were older or smarter or just in a, in a, in a, in a better place than myself. And I've benefited from that in my entire life that I have been able to create those relations with other particularly other men, actually. Which is interesting because it's like, I go back to when you started Noma, there was Renee who was your partner in that business, right? He was the chef and you had the vision of Nordic cooking and starting the Nordic food movement. But you guys, that openness, so I guess it's kind of set the foundation for what will become an, another important relationship with this guy, with, with Renee, right? So how do you guys, you come together and, and then you start as true partners, I guess, in this business, right? And you set out to build, which you just said before, Nordic cooking was pretty much a desert, sort of. And you set out to create the best restaurant in the world with this other, with, with Renee. I mean, the idea from the very beginning was not to create the best restaurant in the world. The idea was to use this new restaurant as, um, as a, a, a kind of a laboratory or an attempt to prove to all restaurants and restaurateurs and chefs and even politicians and businessmen that there was a great potential that we had uh, overlooked until this point in time in our food systems and in our food culture. So for me, Noma was just in the in the very beginning. It was uh, it was my pledge to do something because before we launched Noma, the restaurant we had um, created. Um, the process of defining um, what a great food culture uh, would look like in 2003. How could the Nordic food culture uh, one day end up being counted amongst the greatest ones in the entire world? What values should you um, develop uh, and, and expand on in order to one time, one day as a culture and a society uh, to create food and food products and, and restaurant experiences that, 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 uh, that qualify you for being as great or even greater as you know, the French or the Italian or the Chinese or the Moroccan or the cuisines. And, and, and so, and my personal, I, I engaged, I mean, I more or less succeeded in engaging all major stakeholders in the entire region Nordic Council of Ministers, the Danish Parliament, the CEOs of the greatest companies in, in this vision. And then the Nordic Cuisine Manifesto ended up being the guiding light for this entire movement. And Noma was my personal pledge. I wanted to create a restaurant that unlike all the other great restaurants in 2003, Denmark would, um, would bet 100% on local ingredients and, and come out with a cuisine that was very unlike anything anyone had ever done before. So we were we were the the only ambitious non-French or non-Italian restaurant in the entire country. Imagine that. So, um, so there's got to be like we we I the podcast over the wall, and it, it sounds so easy now. But like if you're creating a whole new thing that's not even in the mindset of the people of your entire country, let there was alone, no demand. There was, there was no, demand, no demand. Zero demand. Like maybe you can talk like what are some of the walls you had to get over? What are some of those stories? Because it just couldn't be easy. Like you just say, okay, and then we're opening a restaurant. 
then I'm convincing ministers. Then I'm, it just seems like there must have been a ton of failure, learning walls to get through. I was I had been working for a governmental committee run by uh, the, the previous social democratic government, and um, they had wanted they kind of, they wanted me to 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 uh, run a, this committee that should uh, inspire uh, food producers to to produce. Um, uh, very good, very sustainable, very delicious high-end food products that we had never had before in Denmark, and also connect them with uh, consumers in Denmark through a brand, a label that was guaranteed by the government. So I should I should create some sort of framework like the USDA, uh, but just uh, d defining amazing food products with an amazing history or, or, or story behind it. And then there was a change of government. Um, so we got a, a, a right wing government and they just fired me and the whole committee <laughs> and all other committees because uh, we, we, we they, they said that we were just some a bunch of self-proclaimed taste experts and uh, no one could be an expert within the field of food. And it was just bullshit. Yeah, and I said I, I can't live the rest of my entire life without trying to convince the that bunch of assholes that they were <laughs> wrong and I was right. So one of the things we had to overcome was to to, to find an, a language uh, and a strategy for for turning those enemies of 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 the idea of of working for a better food culture from a political level. We needed to we needed to find a way to turn them into proponents of this idea. And so that was one obstacle. Then we also, Denmark was composed of, of very powerful, almost monopolistic food companies, even more so than, much more so than the United States. Wow. So we had one big dairy left. We had one big uh, brewery, <clears throat> one big pork producer, and everything else was, you know, absorbed or demolished uh, during, due to that competition. And I knew that diversity, a, a, a multitude of producing products, is one of the most important prerequisites of a great uh, vital food culture. So I had to convince the leaders of monopolistic companies to embrace um, to embrace uh, competition and, and 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 basically work in favor of 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 um, of, of growing a number of small dynamic. Uh, competitors around their feet with much different uh, ideas and beliefs and, and, and abilities to connect with nature and, uh, you know, demanding people. So, I mean, that was a number. But but what I, what I took away from this experience was that it kind of felt easy all the way. I mean, everything was easy because this was a win-win-win scenario. No one in the Nordics would lose from us setting this animal free everybody would i mean not the french restaurants or, or the, the the exporters from southern europe of food products but everyone rooted in denmark and in the nordic region would benefit because this idea uh, would create and, and did create massive gains in terms of tourism it it it, it eventually gave us food products with with a much higher inner value uh, it lowered our health costs because people would end up eating more healthy food than just food making them obese and 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 uh, and, and uh, achieving diabetes. So the reason why it was easy was it was a good idea. It was it was a, a logical idea. Why would we, in one of the most affluent countries in the world, have a, a, a lousy food culture, eating shit, and and in, instead of you know. Uh, having a rich uh, pantry of incredible food products. But I, but I think a lot of this has to do with, and this is kind of can be contrary to the idea of many entrepreneurs have, which is sort of a winner take all mentality. You know, I've got to win at someone else's expense, but it seems like you entered the entrepreneur world. And I think this is what makes you super unique is like with a, it's not I, it's we. You're creating movements, connections, sharing of power. Um, even I, even in what you did in building your restaurant, it's just a very different mentality than a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I'm going to, I've got to beat, there's got to be an enemy. I got to beat them. And, 
it seems like you are, you have something, some idea around entrepreneurism can be shared. It's a community act. It's not just an individual entrepreneurial I act. It's a we act. So what what you know where where what's the power of that that you've seen in your life? Because it's a very different type of way to go about building a business, uh, you know, a, a, a movement, things like that. That's a good question, and it's very true the way you characterize uh, the way I work. The the paradox is that um, this strategy or this approach of mine as a businessman comes from a it's come from a, a point of loss. I believe, to the extent that I know myself at this point in life, I believe that um, I lost so many things when I was young then that I, I couldn't stand losing people uh, or uh, competitions. Um, so I had to find a way in life where I had, where I, I diminished my own chance of losing. Um, so I, if I dis defined, uh, I mean, challenges, I but also, I, at the same time, I love challenges uh, and I wanted to do something great. So I somehow ended up um, finding a way of working as an entrepreneur where I created always much, much bigger value outside of uh, my own company than within the company I was building. And I never, ever did what I was taught in school, namely to enter into an existing market and try to steal some market share from other people that would hate me for doing it. So I always ended up building, building um, uh, what you would call new opportunities in, in, in a blue ocean where there was nothing. So I unfolded um, demand and supply structures that didn't exist before I entered into that part of the market. And somehow that a business strategy or that innovation strategy or that entrepreneurial strategy correlated extremely well with the idea of being a change, an agent of change. I never wanted to, I had no interest in building a big company. I just ended up doing it anyway as a, as a side effect of doing something meaningful. I wanted to change the system. I wanted to change people. I wanted I wanted uh, our country and our food culture to be so much more different than the one that we had. So, and 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 that became my approach to doing a business and working in any kind of circumstance and smaller or bigger communities. So it works well for someone who works where I work. If if I went into the American dairy industry or yeah. uh, wine business, it probably would work as well. So you, and it, this strategy, how many companies have you created? How many uh, out there between, yeah, between what do you have? 15 and, and, and 100. 15 and 100 and I can assure you, yeah. It's extraordinary. And, and when we look, obviously there's, there's Noma, but there's so many more. And there's also a lot of companies created that are, they're not for profit. Right, there's stuff you've, you've put in the world to help others. It, yeah, and it seems like giving, even when you didn't have a lot, giving is important, right? Even though you're out there trying to build your own thing and you're focused on your stuff, it always seemed like giving was a big portion of your vision of yourself or, you know, why do you think it's so important? Because people, when they're entrepreneurs, they're there, I, you know, and they're just focused on their building. I don't have time, I don't have money, I can't help anyone right now, I'll do that when I'm rich. But it, obviously, incorporating that into the journey seemed important to you. We all got, I mean, we're all going to be composed one day, right? Yes. And, and, and one day when we grow very old, we're going to tell our children and our grandchildren uh, what we achieved in life and what was our story. And uh, I can only speak for myself, but I dream of being a happy man in, in that moment in time. And also, I hope that at that point in time, I would have been a source of inspiration for my children. And um, I, I, I frequently ask myself, what would be the most important and, 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 and the greatest thing I could do from the perspective of the world right now with the resources I have around me and, I, and the knowledge I have gained? If I was God's instrument, what would I be doing right now? It's not easy to answer the question in a very honest way, and, and you, 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 we all know what it feels like to be preoccupied with our, you yeah. know, commercial challenges and everything we have in our inbox. But um, it is extremely rewarding 
uh, on the on, you know immediately on the personal level to do something great. But another thing that some people may not understand on, on, until they try it is that when you walk around in your business life in your for-profit world and you are hiring people, you are trying to motivate people. It, it makes a big difference to to have a purpose that is what you stand what what you stand up for at the end of the day. It motivates great people to be part of something that does truly amazing things in the world. So I I, I would go as far as to say that whatever number of millions of, of, of dollars I've given away through philanthropy, that money given away has come back many times in the for-profit world. And, yeah. and that, that is really, I think that is an interesting learning. Yeah, and and, and I learned this too. It's, I had a the psychiatrist, Dr. Frank Morio, who we did a we did a podcast with him, and he told me, go volunteer at a homeless shelter and sleep there. Because you may not be feeling good about where you are in your life, but there are people a lot less fortunate than you, even though you're sleeping on a couch in this dumpy office in the middle of New York City, there are people who need your help. And I remember going there and feeding people and then sleeping overnight, and then they left in the morning. But I remember feeling a sense of joy, even though I wasn't happy with where I was personally, I had a sense that helping others, and I think for entrepreneurs, it's an easy way to, to realize you can have an impact, even though you, there may be challenges in your life. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's what I've seen. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, what we are is how we make people feel. And um, and um, what I saw in the eyes of the people I met in Brownsville uh, made my day. And, and, um, and I felt that it was much harder to truly achieve that feeling of warmth and meaning and, uh, and, and happiness from no matter how many cups of coffee I sold in Manhattan or no matter how many bread people were buying or how many Michelin stars we were being awarded. Um, that other thing where you are uh, a source of a true source of joy and hope and opportunity uh, in other people's lives, nothing compares to that. Um, and I do think, and but also if even, I mean, why would you not do it? You don't, why would you not do something of, of a philanthropic nature? For, for me, there's no reason absolutely not to do it. I have never at any point in time feel distracted from achieving whatever I wanted to achieve in the for-profit world just because I was doing something in, in, the, in the non-profit world. Uh, so there's, there's no question. And you don't need, also you don't need money to, to be a philanthropist. You, you can, if you are smart, you can share ideas. You can share some of your hours. You can, you can connect people. I mean, there's so many things you can do with the resources that you have. There's so much need out there, and and there is absolutely no reason not to do something. And also, I just want to state it, Rob, that what I have now you were very kind to me in the beginning, and, and you still are in the conversation. But I have given. I could have given. I, I don't feel that I gave you know everything. I could have given much more. I even, I always wake up in the morning with the feeling that I, I need to do something more generous. So I, yeah. I haven't done much. I mean, compared to the resources I've been given, the luck that I've had, I've only done very little. Well, you've done a lot, but I I, I agree. We all think there's always more, right? We can do to help others because there's too many people to help. If we knew that everyone was helped and everyone was living a way above the poverty level and their their food secure, their safety is there, and and I call it like the everyday philanthropist. They, everyone can be an everyday philanthropist. You don't have to be wealthy and all this. And right. but but I think what's interesting about what you're saying, especially for entrepreneurs that are out there today, the world has changed radically through this virus, and a lot of the companies that will be created out of it will be focused on. How do we help others? How do we create meaningful connections? And, and I want to turn to this document you shared with me the other day. It's, it's, it's your manifesto, it's, it's principles, um, and it's called Unconditional Hospitality. And you wrote out these 
principles of, of what you want to bring to the world. But I, I want to just write, if you don't mind, can I read something that you wrote? Or So you say, as individuals and as a company, <clears throat> it is our responsibility to assume a growing responsibility in the world. Martin Luther King once said, we need to build a longer table, not a higher wall. Not a day goes by where we do not ask ourselves, how can we use our resources and our gifts to become a source of hope and opportunity for those who feel excluded? And I just thought that this, this I mean, this whole document I think is very powerful, but you know, why did you write this? And this is recently, right? This is, this is something, where, what, why? This, this just came out of you recently. What, 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 what made you write this, this document, this, you know, these so, beautiful words? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's just one page, but I also think that that at the end it became um, a, a very, a very, a, a pretty strong uh, what do you call it, distillation or distillat? This what do you call it when you distillation? Yeah, distillation. Distillation. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I was when I when I went came back from New York City, and 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 tried to you know reinstall myself in Denmark after three wonderful and um, demanding years over there, I felt empty uh, in a way. Um, and um, I was looking out a little bit for some sort of um, direction or strategy or um, just an understanding of you know what was my role in life. And at the same time, the company that I had left and that had been um taken over if you can say so by a capital fund they noma. realized the, the that noma, the noma everything with noma right this is the, the restaurant and so the actually so i'm speaking about the, my, my the main company myers okay. myers the yeah, main yeah. company noma was a, a child of the main company myers, myers where yeah. i become a minority owner yeah and, and and this new owner back in 2015 felt that he could do much better with you know ap applying their methods and ways and so on but then five six years later when i was back they you know had a different feeling and and then they they also kind of realized that they also had lost i mean when i was around nobody was in doubt about what it all was about because i was living that with my entire physical presence every single day during the entire week but when i've been gone for some years and, and 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 other ideas and beliefs and systems had been driving the everyday life of the company. People had lost, you know, sense of who they were, where they were going, why they were doing what they were doing. And they asked me to to or they gave me the opportunity to write a purpose statement for Myers. And 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 eventually I succeeded in with with the help of, of amazing colleagues to produce a narrative that works for me as a person, as an individual, and that also somehow got um, embraced by, by, by the company. And even this, this uh, you know, profit-oriented uh, stakeholder or shareholder. And that for me is, 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 uh, gave me a wow feeling. So we have, a, we have something that I am personally fired up by that, that sometimes put tears in the eyes of, of you know, people outside the company and that works so so now we just need to ask ourselves so what does this in reality mean for how we conduct business on a daily level how does this how what how should we calibrate our endeavors and our prioritizations tomorrow now that we are adopting this document this manifesto or this purpose statement so that is the interesting part that is beginning now because this was done during corona lockdown uh, and it was kind of vitalized by some very interesting and, and rewarding experiences we had uh, in spite of corona where we were doing crazy things in denmark because everything was locked down and we, we didn't just want to just uh, go to sleep so we found new ways of connecting with uh, our friends and fans and customers uh, so even though i mean corona was a horrible year in many 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 ways but that was also light. Obviously, the hospitality industry just got massively hit. I mean, this is your world. And like you were saying, from it is a light. You found some light in, in there. And, that, and that's where a lot of this manifesto, I guess, came from. But uh, I mean, 
how do you see that? I mean, obviously that's a macro event, shut down restaurants, shut everything down, your whole world's upside down, but you're finding light in it. And how do you do that? You know, how, what, what, how did you see the light? Or what do you see? What do you see for that industry? I guess a better question is, what do you see for the hospitality industry? Because right now it's still in flux. A lot of restaurants went under, you know, it looks like they're not coming back. What, but what do you see? I, I don't know if I can save the restaurant industry or, or I mean, or I can truly impact it, but it, it, um, it definitely will produce some, some bankruptcies and, and you will have new, you know, new restaurants or new companies coming into those spaces. I'm not sure that we will, that we will eat out less, but um, I am pretty sure that, that the combination of Corona that made us aware of what is around us where we live because we couldn't travel any longer. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, the whole climate challenge that is facing the entire globe. Uh, and that also has made us realize that um, if we don't help a suffering man in Africa, uh, that might kill us. So, so that the sufferings of, of other people or the conditions that they are going to live under kind of end up impacting our affluent lives in the Western world. So all of that together, I believe, inspires us or motivates us or gives us the insight that we need to, we need to conduct our lives in a different way. We need to redefine our relationship to uh, countries that don't have the resources that we have. And also it is impacting our food systems. Um, so what we see in Europe and, 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 and also in, in, in the Northern part of Europe, is that farmers and fishermen and um, food producers and uh, chefs and private people are connecting at a very different level and are redefining their relationships. Uh, so I believe that we will see much more local, coherent and also uh, resilient and um, maybe even uh, efficient food systems than the ones that we have grown up with, where we were taught that everything, the bigger it is, the bigger and the more concentrated uh, the production is of meat or milk or whatever, the better and the smarter it is from the world. But we forgot about the externalities. We forgot about the concentration of power. We forgot about the inclusion. We forgot, we forgot about animal welfare and, and, and all the, so all the things that came with it. And um, so I think that, there are a lot of interesting learnings to be made from from these past years, and um, and the restaurant industry, and and the concept of of being uh, in, in hospitality definitely, uh, you know, remains an incredible an incredibly uh, interesting place to be as a as a as a as a person, and and also from a, from a business perspective. But the challenge and the way we understand our challenge, fortunately is changing for the better, at least seen from the perspective of our grand grandchildren. I, I, I read an article that there's like a million entrepreneurs who were created already through Corona, through the coronavirus in the last year or so, the last year. So you think about all these entrepreneurs because they, they lost their jobs and people are, you know, going in, it'll be interesting to see how they impact the world. And if they take your philosophy or your philosophies of, of it's about the we community, and, and changing some of the old things that got broken through the coronavirus. Now there's a whole new world. And I think that's what makes entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. You see the light, as you said, you see a different way to look at it. Um, my, my last question, I can speak with you for hours. You know, it's like, usually we go to dinner and chat it up. But um, my last question is like, what, what advice, I always like to ask, like if you could give a one piece of advice to entrepreneurs that are out there based on your perspective of how it all works the way you viewed the world, the way you became an entrepreneur, what would you give them as advice? That's a wonderful question. Um, I guess that my, my single piece of advice would be that uh, as you go about in your life, you will enter into thousands of relations. And uh, I would recommend my younger self or any any young entrepreneur to enter into all these relations uh, with the idea of trying to fulfill the other person's dreams throughout that uh, connection 
and always be whatever you get out of it yourself. Always make sure that the other one benefits big time from knowing you and working with you. That attitude will create long lasting um, friendships and you will feel later in your life that this will come back to you maybe, you know, 100 times. Uh, even though in the short term it could be slightly more time consuming to do something great towards somebody else than just what was enough for that per for the, for that relation to sustain a few hours or a few weeks give more give more just give more give make more. sure that the other guy make sure that the other guy feels that he is rewarded from from working with you even though it's a small guy don't only do that in in strategic relations with government or big companies do it with everyone everybody you touch everyone you work with make them feel good make them feel important give give to them don't always look to give to yourself give to them first and the universe has a way to give back to you i guess and don't hate yourself for failing at doing that a few times i mean none of us is perfect but use that as a as a as a guiding idea that works it's awesome klaus well thank you for being on the show um, you're just an awesome person in the world. It's, you've got also, I think, a, uh, something you started many years ago, a philosophy about building companies and giving back, I think more than ever is needed now. And I think it's just, it's just awesome that you'll be able to give us your wisdom and share it with other people in the world. Thank you very much. And, uh, look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Awesome.